We have one more group of viruses to talk about in terms of genome replication strategies. And these are actually retroid viruses. The main family we're going to talk about today are the retroviruses, which do reverse transcription. But you'll see at the very end, we'll briefly talk about two other virus families whose members encode a reverse transcriptase enzyme. So we're going to talk about the process of replication, mostly about retroviruses today, how reverse transcription works, and also integration. This story begins at the beginning of the 1900s. You remember the plant virus, tobacco mosaic virus, the first virus discovered at the end of the 1800s? Well, right after the turn of the century, 1908, the first cancer-causing virus discovered, chicken leukemia virus, by these gentlemen here, Ellerman and Bang. And three years later, Rouse sarcoma virus, discovered by Peyton Rouse. Here he worked at the Rockefeller Medical Institute, which is what it was called at the time, now Rockefeller University. 55 years later, he got the Nobel Prize for this, the longest incubation period for a Nobel Prize, as far as I'm aware. We're going to revisit Dr. Rouse later on when we talk about viruses and cancer. These were called tumor viruses. And Rouse's discovery, a farmer brought him a chicken with a big tumor on its side. Can you imagine bringing a chicken into my lab? And he eventually isolated the viruses from that tumor and called it a uh, tumor virus. It was given his name, Rouse sarcoma virus. Later on, others found that these tumor viruses had RNA genomes. Now, as we'll see later, many years later, after this discovery, we found out that there are also DNA viruses that can cause tumors. But today, we're going to focus on these RNA tumor viruses. Many years later, after Rouse, a virologist by the name of Howard Temin, working at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, began to figure out what was going on with these tumor viruses. By this time, it had been found that they had RNA genomes. And his insight was crucial for figuring out what was going on. The first point is that he learned, and subsequently others did, that if you infect cells with Rouse's tumor virus, it caused morphological changes in the cells, which we call transformation. And we're going to talk about those in some detail later. Suffice it to say that it was a permanent change in the way the cells behave. So Temin, uh, lo his logic was somehow this RNA virus is making a permanent change to the host cell. It's got to be transfer. It, it's got to be changing its RNA genome into DNA somehow, because that's the only way he could envision making a permanent change to the host cell. So his postulate was the retrovirus somehow makes a DNA copy of its genome, and that gets integrated into the host cell, becomes a permanent part of it. And he called this the provirus hypothesis, which eventually he and another virologist, David Baltimore, proved. Now, you, you may remember David Baltimore from the Baltimore scheme. He, in the 70s, had this idea of arranging all the known viruses by tracing their pathway to mRNA. And remember, he, lo his logic was positive strand viruses don't have to have the polymerase in the particle. Negative strand viruses do. And he looked for a polymerase in the particles of a negative strand virus, VSV, and found it. Then when Temin's idea started gaining popularity, Baltimore said, there's got to be an enzyme in the particle. And he, he looked for it. And he and Temin both discovered it uh, at the same time. And they published back-to-back -back papers in Nature. And so here, they independently discovered reverse transcriptase in the particles of the virus. On the left, Howard Temin here, his, his paper, RNA-dependent DNA polymerase in virions of Rouse sarcoma virus. And he talks about his idea why these viruses should make a DNA copy, which he called the DNA provirus hypothesis. Uh, and Baltimore independently found RNA-dependent DNA polymerase in RNA tumor viruses. 
So this was a transformative event in molecular biology. So they're getting the Nobel Prize, along with, by the way, Renato Dubalco, who developed a plaque assay for uh, animal viruses that we talked about earlier. Transformative event. First of all, it let us understand how RNA tumor viruses transform cells. And there was so much research done on this enzyme and these viruses that when AIDS came along in the 1980s, we knew exactly what was going on. And there, there were very rapid ways to make drugs because we knew about the enzymes involved and so forth. But even more importantly than that, if, as if that's not important enough with 35 million people infected today, this discovery was one of the cornerstones of the biotechnology revolution. Reverse transcriptase allowed you to make DNA copies of RNA, which you could then clone in a bacterial plasmid. That was the other cornerstone of that revolution. And that is a brand new industry that formed uh, in the 1970s. Ju even today, reverse transcriptase is essential. You don't really need it to clone genes anymore. You can synthesize them chemically as DNA. But if you want to do PCR and look for RNA viruses, and if you're following Zika, you know that people are doing PCR. How do you do PCR in an RNA virus genome? PCR is a DNA-based uh, amplification. Well, you first take reverse transcriptase and make a DNA copy, and then you amplify it by PCR. That's why it's called RT-PCR, reverse transcription PCR. This enzyme is incredibly important. I can't emphasize every lab has some reverse transcriptase in the freezer. We have these two. Of course, they stand on the shoulders of giants, right? It's always the case with great discoveries, many people before them as well. Now, the other reason this was so important was that the discovery of reverse transcriptase countered the central dogma proposed originally by Watson and Crick that all organisms have DNA and the flow of information goes from DNA to RNA to protein. The central dogma. Retroviruses reversed it and that's why we call them retro. It's not because they're 50s. Although I have, if you come to office hours, you'll see a picture on my door that is a play on that. I should actually put it into this lecture. They got their name because they can reverse the flow of information from RNA to DNA to protein. So that's why we have retroviruses and reverse transcriptase because it's reversing the flow. <clears throat> so here we are at our Baltimore scheme. So now you see why I put so much emphasis on this. This is not only a very useful way to organize your thinking, but it kind of shows you how Baltimore was thinking when he devised his experiments to discover RT. He tells me that he did about six weeks worth of, bless you, six weeks worth of experiments, and that was it, and that's all it took for him to get his prize. Of course, there was many, much more work before that. So here we have our mRNA in the middle, and today we're gonna to talk about retroviruses, which have an RNA genome, but which convert it to a DNA copy from which mRNA is made. We're also gonna talk about hepatitis B virus, this virus, even though it has a DNA genome, it has reverse transcriptase in its reproductive cycle. So it's not a retrovirus, we would call it a retroid virus. If you want to give a name to all the viruses that have reverse transcriptase, which include retroviruses, hepatitis B virus, and you'll see some plant viruses as well. So we're gonna mainly talk about retros, but at the end we'll get to Hep B and the others. So this is what a retrovirus looks like. There are subtle differences between the different types of retroviruses, but for simplicity, uh, let's look at them here with an example of this one. This is on the left, a electron micrograph, which doesn't tell you a lot except that there's an envelope and a dense, an electron dense core. So when I say electron dense, means that the electrons can't go through it. They're reflected and that's why it's dark. So there's your envelope and your core. And on the right is a schematic diagram. These are envelope viruses. They have glycoproteins embedded in the membrane. In the center is the nucleic acid. So it's a plus-stranded RNA. And there are two copies of that RNA in the virus particle. We'll talk about why that is in a bit. Those RNAs are coated in protein. Furthermore, they're encased in an icosahedral capsid for at least some of the retroviruses, not all of them perhaps. And then the capsid is encased in an envelope. 
So that's a nucleocapsid. You can actually call the RNA protein complex a nucleocapsid, or you could call the RNA in the icosahedral structure a nucleocapsid because it's a substructure. And within this particle, not only is there the viral RNA, plus-stranded viral RNA, there are a few other viral proteins, including reverse transcriptase, there is a protease, the yellow molecule, and an integrase, and we'll talk about their roles. We'll talk about reverse transcriptase and integrase today. Here is the schematic of the genome of a simple retrovirus, avian leukosis virus, the kind of virus from which Rouse uh, isolated Rouse sarcoma virus, as we'll see later. Now, at the top is uh, an unusual designation. It's the proviral DNA. This is the DNA, which is the, the copy of the RNA genome. The RNA genome is actually shown here below. But at the top is what we call proviral DNA. This is the integrated DNA copy of the virus, which you find in the genome. And you see it encodes uh, a number of different viral proteins. For the simpler retroviruses, they encode a core or a structural region called GAG. Uh, the polymerase and other enzymes are encoded in the middle called Paul, and then we have the envelope glycoproteins encoded at the three prime end. And these are uh, produced from a messenger RNA, which is shown in green in the middle, and you can see translation of the GAG protein. You have to get a GAG pole fusion protein in order to make reverse transcriptase, and we'll talk about that next time. And all these derive from an unspliced mRNA, which covers the whole genome. And remember, last time we talked, or not last time, but some, some lectures ago, we talked about how unspliced mRNAs can get out of the nucleus. And so here's an example of why you need to do that. There is a splicing event that happens, uh, which removes the gag in the pole regions, and that's shown at the bottom. And that gives you the mRNA encoding envelope. So you can't access the envelope open reading frame unless you do this splicing event. So you have an unspliced and a singly spliced envelope mRNA. And these are both produced by transcription from this provirus, which, which sits in your chromosomal DNA or the chromosomal DNA of the host animal that's infected with the retrovirus. So let's go through a replication cycle to give you an overview, and then we're going to look at reverse transcription, because how that works is really, really interesting. So here we have retrovirus particles attaching, sorry, at the top, the retrovirus particles are attaching to receptors on the host cell surface. They're taken in. Many retroviruses fuse at the surface. Some go in via endocytosis, but this one we're showing fusing at the surface. Uh, and then we're left with the core particle. The genome doesn't ever totally uncoat. It's usually in some kind of a subviral particle, and reverse transcription occurs in the cytoplasm within that substructure. So that plus-stranded RNA can't be accessed by ribosomes because it's still encased in a structure. And that's why in the beginning when we were talking about plus-stranded RNAs, I said the retroviral RNAs are an exception to the idea that a plus strand is always translated. This one is shielded from ribosomes and the reverse transcriptase in the particle makes a double-stranded DNA, which you can see in the cytoplasm. And then that's imported into the nucleus where it's integrated into chromosomal DNA. And that's what we call the provirus. The provirus is a very special definition. It means retroviral DNA integrated into the host. This uh, DNA in the cytoplasm is not proviral DNA. It's uh, retroviral DNA, but it's unintegrated. Here in the, in the chromosome, it's a provirus. So from sitting in the chromosome, then, the proviral DNA is transcribed to give messenger RNAs encoding the structural proteins and the enzymes that we just talked about and the glycoproteins as well. So unspliced and spliced mRNAs go out into the cytoplasm and eventually uh, the structural proteins and the enzymes come together to form new virus particles. We'll talk about assembly uh, in a couple of lectures. So reverse transcriptase, let's look at this enzyme a little bit. This is a primer dependent enzyme, very much like some of the enzymes we've already talked about. Uh, it, in this case, though, the primer can be DNA or RNA. And as you will see when we go through the scheme of reverse transcription, at different points in the process of converting retroviral RNA to DNA, both RNA and DNA primers are used. The template can be RNA, the retroviral genome, but it can also be DNA. What does that mean? Well, if you make a single-stranded DNA 
copy of RNA, if you want to make a double-stranded DNA, which you have to do to integrate, the, retro, the reverse transcriptase has to be able to copy that single-stranded DNA and make a double-stranded copy. That's why the template can be either RNA or DNA. And of course, it incorporates DNTPs. It makes DNA. It does not make RNA. Reverse transcriptase does not make RNA. So again, at the top is our primer template diagram that we have used for all the polymerases. Uh, the direction of chain growth is 5 to 3 prime. The template is read in a 3 to 5 prime direction. And DNTPs are added at the 3 prime end uh, to make the new chain. So that's reverse transcriptase. Now, an interesting and important point is that RT apparently predates retroviruses. It's been around before there were retroviruses on Earth. Bacteria and archaea have reverse transcriptase activity. You can find it in the genomes and in the particles and in the actual bacteria and archaeal uh, microbes. So RT evolved before the separation of archaea, bacteria, and eukaryotes. So eukaryotes have RT. You have a little bit of RT in your genome as well, bacteria, archaea. So it clearly evolved before the three branched out. So here is a simplified version of the tree of life with bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes, which all derived from a common ancestor. So some point before these three split off, RT arose a long, long time ago. Now you may remember at the beginning I was talking about an RNA world, the first a world of replicating molecules on Earth. As soon as the Earth cooled down, we think that small replicating RNA molecules were actually the first life forms. They're not really living, but they are replicating. And they existed for a long time in what we call the RNA world. And then uh, proteins arose at some point. And then DNA arose. Well, what, how did the DNA arise? It didn't just magically appear. Probably this enzyme uh, reverse transcriptase evolved from a polymerase that was copying the RNAs and that made a DNA and those DNAs then formed a, a world of their own. So reverse transcriptase is very old. It is not unique to retroviruses. And as I said at the beginning, there are other viruses that have reverse transcriptase in their life cycle besides retroviruses, the hepatitis B virus and the plant virus called colimoviruses or the family name is colimoviridae. So on our scheme where we aligned the protein sequences of the four classes of nucleic acid polymerase, and we've now talked about all of these RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, RNA-dependent DNA polymerase, reverse transcriptase, and we have our DNA, DNA, and our DNA, RNA polymerases. And remember, these uh, four types of enzyme all look like a right hand with a palm and fingers domain. They have conserved motifs shown in the colors A, B, C, D and E in some of them. And I told you that the C portion, the conserved C region of these polymerases typically contains the active site. And in that active site, that is where the nucleotides are added to the growing chain of nucleic acid. And in that active site, there are two aspartate residues for some of the polymerases, they differ in others. Uh, and those aspartates hold metal ions in place, which are an essential part of the cat catalytic reaction. So here you can see in reverse transcriptase, it's an ASP, ASP is the conserved sequence. Uh, and you also find that in negative strand RNA polymerases as well. Now uh, reverse transcriptase, the enzyme has actually two enzymatic activities, not, not just being able to make DNA from RNA, but in the same molecule there's an activity called RNase H. And this is a very special enzyme that cleaves RNA only when it's in a double-stranded form. It will not cleave single-stranded RNA. It can be RNA-RNA or RNA-DNA duplexes. And it makes what we call endonucleolytic cleavages. Those are shown by the red arrows. Endonucleolytic simply means the enzyme's cutting within the sequence rather than at the ends, which would be exonucleolytic activity. If an enzyme were chewing the ends away, that would be an exonuclease. This is an endonuclease that uh, cleaves, and it cleaves between the oxygen and the phosphate in each phosphodiester bond, and it makes short oligonucleotides with a three prime 
with a 5 prime phosphate and a 3 prime hydroxyl. So the red arrow shows you the cleavage. So you get then PO and a bunch of nucleotides and an O. So there's a P at the 5 prime end and an O at the 3 prime end. So you may be wondering, what does this have to do with retroviruses and reverse transcription? You'll see in the, uh, the scheme of reverse transcription that we go over in a moment that this is an essential activity. <clears throat> so here is the structure of one of many reverse transcriptases. This happens to be the reverse transcriptase of HIV, and it's shown here at the top. And you can see uh, the same color code has been used that we've been using all along, so the active site is up here in yellow. And you can see labeled the palm and the thumb and the fingers domain. Now the HIV reverse transcriptase actually comes in two subunits, a P66 and a P51 subunit. And the P66 has the catalytic activities, both the polymerization and the RNA-SH. And the P51 is another subunit that's simply required for activity. So here, the P66, you can tell by the orange color that's up here, the RNA-SH domain, and P51 fits in down here. So it is a heterodimer. Not all reverse transcriptases are dimers. Some of them are a single polypeptide with both activities. On the lower left is a cartoon of the RT, which shows you these active sites and how the DNA is made from an RNA template. So here uh, on the left side, here is your polymerase active site. We've got our two uh, metal ions binding to the aspartates there. Uh, the RNA comes in from the left here, so the, the three prime end is coming in, and the, and the DNA is the blue strand, which is made in a five to three prime direction. Of course, the nucleotides are added in the active site, and as a nucleotide is added, the strand shifts forward one, and the DNA comes out the right end of the molecule. Now, RNA goes in the left end, but it doesn't come out. It's kind of like a roach trap, right? Um, comes in the left end, uh, goes past the active site, the DNA is made, and then the RNA passes the RNA-SH active site, which also has two metal ions held in place, because cutting is just the opposite of polymerizing, really. And there, the RNA is degraded. So what comes out is just single-stranded DNA. So single-stranded RNA in, single-stranded DNA comes out. Now, this enzyme is, yes? If RNA, if RNA's H only cleaves double-stranded RNA, how does it degrade the, uh, the single strand of RNA? So RNA's H will cleave a duplex that is either RNA-RNA or RNA-DNA. Oh. Can do either one. So here it's RNA. DNA, and that's why it's working, yeah. Now this enzyme is very slow. It only does, it takes four hours to copy one genome. The genome of retroviruses is nine kilobases long. It takes four hours to do that, yes? Is it now segmented? Is this part of the uh, segmented? No, this, this genome is one piece only of RNA. No segments here, yeah. Um, nine, four hours, and it's very error prone. Now all polymerases make mistakes just like we do. And uh, that's why we have erasers on our pencils or backspace on your computer. And polymerases all make mistakes too. DNA polymerases have a backspace key. They can correct their mistakes, but RNA polymerases and reverse transcriptases cannot. So the, the errors, and here the RT makes one mistake every 10,000 to million bases. About one mistake per each time it copies the genome. So this, gives, this is actually good for the virus. It gives it variability and the ability to escape various environmental pressures. So you throw an antiviral at HIV, it just selects for the mutant viruses that are resistant. We'll talk later about how to get around that. So slow and error prone. Okay, our first question. Reverse transcriptase has revolutionized molecular biology. Which statement about the enzyme is not correct? It's unique to retroviruses. It's packaged in the retrovirus particle. It has RNA-SH activity, the RT protein. The name of the enzyme comes from its ability to reverse the flow of genetic information, and it might have bridged the ancient RNA world and the DNA worlds. All right, 96% got the right answer. RT is unique to retroviruses is wrong. It's the right answer because it's wrong. Some of you said it's packaged in the particle. Yes, it is packaged in the particle, so that's not wrong. Um, it reverses the flow, so that's not wrong, and it might have bridged, that's not wrong. I know these are tricky. All right, let's look at reverse transcription. Here is the genome 
as it is in the particle at the top left. It's a dimer, two molecules of RNA. Let's blow that up below and see what it looks like. It has a five prime cap and a three prime poly A. It's a typical messenger RNA inside the capsid. As I've said before, if you pulled out this RNA, if you extracted it, purified it from the protein, you could translate this in vitro. If you put it in a cell, uh, it would be translated into protein. But it's always kept in the particle and it's not translated. The RNA is, as I said, about 9 kb long. It's coated with nucleocapsid protein in the virus particle. So unusual for a plus-stranded RNA to be coated with nucleocapsid protein. And of course, there are about uh, 50 to 100 molecules of reverse transcriptase in each particle. And on this slide is simply shown the GAG, the pol, and the envelope coding regions, the polymerase and the RNase H, and the integrase are encoded in the pol region. And look at this, very interesting. At the five prime end of the RNA, near the five prime end, you have a molecule of tRNA hybridized to the viral RNA. Each one has its own tRNA, so there are two molecules. This is a cellular RNA, right? Transfer RNA, which is involved in the synthesis of proteins. What is that doing there? We'll talk about that in a moment. Why do we have two RNA genomes in the particle? Well, we think, and there's some evidence to support this, because it gives the virus some, some ro genetic robustness, if you will. Just think of it this way. If you had one RNA and it sustained a mutation, either by error-prone polymerase or by ultraviolet light, maybe that virus would never replicate. But if you had two, you might be able to restore a functional genome from two RNAs. And so what we think is that the two RNAs give the virus relative resistance to mutation. There are two copies of all genes. So when the reverse transcriptase is copying the genome, as you'll see in a moment, it's actually flicking back and forth randomly between two strands. And in the end, it randomly may make a good RNA, even if you have mutations in one of the two. Okay, so here we show uh, the red A is a mu mutant A gene, uh, but you've got, um, well, the way this is working, it's not a mutant A. Let's, let's say that uh, A black is mu mutated. Uh, so you copy B and C, and then you, you randomly copy the other strand, you get a wild type gene uh, so that the virus can work. Okay, so the, this is our idea that having two copies of the genome makes you more resistant to inactivation by mutation. All right, let's get back to reverse transcription. Remember, I told you that at the five prime, near the five prime end of the two RNAs, there's a tRNA hybridized. So let's expand that now. So now we're looking just at 100 bases or so here from the cap at the five prime end. And there's the tRNA. And it's hybridized to the viral RNA at what we call the primer binding site, PBS. PBS, you'll see that a lot, primer binding site. All that means is the sequence complementary to the tRNA. And it's set up so the three prime end of the tRNA could be a primer. Then we have some sequences here which are going to be really important for you to understand how they work. And you'll see they're called R, U5, and this is three, that's the three prime end of the tRNA. So on the mRNA, we have R and U5 regions, and these are, contain lots of repeated sequences. At the bottom, uh, simply shows you how the tRNA insinuates itself into the viral RNA. Is, on the left is the viral RNA in this region uh, without the tRNA, and the tRNA just fits in here, base pairs in this manner, as you see here, and there's the free 3 prime N. Now, when this virus infects a cell, as I said, the membrane is gone, you're left with a subviral particle with the genome and reverse transcriptase in it, and that makes DNA in the cytoplasm. Let's see how this works. This is an amazing process. It took about 10 years for people to figure out uh, before cloning was, was possible to do. So here on the left is our input viral RNA. It's got the five prime N. The tRNA primer is hybridized to it. This is in the virus particle. Just pay attention to the fact that at the five prime N, we have R and U5. And at the three prime N, we also have an R, same sequence, but we have a U3 instead of a U5. Now, the first step is that the reverse transcriptase uses that three prime end of the tRNA to start making DNA. It makes this short piece of DNA, but it runs into the end of the molecule at the five prime end. And you may be thinking, what the hell? Why is it evolved like this so that the primer is way at the five prime end? This is so dumb. Well, all I can say is never say nature is dumb because it's way smarter than all of us. And the reason it's there will become obvious when we go through this process. 
So what happens here is that it just so happens that the three prime end of the genome is probably in proximity to the five prime end. And, and so this strong strop uh, DNA is gonna continue on the other strand. After it's made, you can see it's being chopped up by reverse, trans, uh, sorry, by RNSH. Those are the little green bars under there designating that it's being chopped up. And in the third panel, you can see there's no more RNA left there. But the R sequence, now remember, when we started, we had little r on the RNA at the five prime end. When we made DNA, we made big R, the complement. That's what big R means. So now big R is gonna hybridize to little r at the three prime end. You couldn't make this up yourself. This is brilliant, and that's just the beginning. And let's see what happens. You got that hybridization, the RR annealing, and the reverse transcriptase continues. It continues to copy that RNA genome all the way around, and in so doing, as it's going, it's chewing it up as well. Remember, the RNASH is the same enzyme. So the, the blue is the first strand of DNA, and we've chopped away most uh, of the RNA. And we continue all the way around to the primer again. But look in the middle here, we have a sequence called PPT, which stands for polypurine tract. It doesn't get chopped up. Uh, for some reason, it escapes RNASH, and why? Well, that has to serve as a primer for the second strand of DNA. So even before the first strand is done, in light blue, the enzyme starts to make a second strand. And you may ask, how can one enzyme do that? Well, there's 50 enzymes in the particle, so this is not a problem to do multiple things at once. All right, we continue around. That first strand now, you can see, has gone all the way back, and it has copied the primer binding site. So it's, uh, it's duplicating the sequence where the tRNA was bound, all right? And eventually the tRNA is cut off. The blue continues now around. The blue will hybrid. That primer binding site is duplicated, so uh, before the tRNA is removed, the second strand is synthesized uh, at the part of the tRNA that's present there in the genome on the left, and that makes the bottom and the top complementary. So this dark blue and the light blue strands will be complementary because the first strand has also copied the primer binding site. So now on the right is what happens. You have a full length first strand and you have a little bit of the second strand being made which initiated at U3. Let's continue this process. So we're at the top now. That second strand in the dark blue is gonna continue around the molecule straight forward and go all the way to the other end. And that gives us a linear double-stranded DNA copy of the genome. Now. The reason why we do all this weird stuff, these jumps and copying things twice, is so that we can reconstitute the genome from the RNA. The RNA is shorter than the genome. Sounds familiar. For a lot of the viruses we've talked about, the mRNAs are shorter. But this weird reverse transcription, which I call Baroque, ensures that from the mRNA you can actually construct a full-length DNA. Let's look at it here. The RNA starts with a little R sequence, and then it has a U5 and a primer binding site. And at the three prime end, you have the polypurine tract, U3 and R. But look at the DNA, U3, R, U5, primer binding site, Pri polypurine tract, U3, R, U5. That's the complete genome with U3, R, U5, U3, R, U5 at either end. The RNA doesn't have that. Why? Because the RNA starts at the R sequence. It doesn't start at the very left end of the genome. And it also terminates at the R sequence here, so it's missing the ends. So the RNA is too short, but it's got repeats built into it so that when you do this weird reverse transcription, it generates the full length viral DNA. And these sequences at either end, U3R, U5, U3R, U5, these are called long terminal repeats or LTRs. You'll see this everywhere in retrovirology. So they're generated by reverse transcription. You don't have LTRs in the RNA. It's only part of the LTRs. They only have LTRs in the DNA. So it's, a, it's, it's characteristic of a reverse transcription to make a double-stranded DNA flanked with these LTRs. Next is, which of the following steps occur during reverse transcription of retroviral genomic RNA? Priming of minus DNA synthesis by tRNA, two template exchanges, degradation of the viral RNA by RNase H, generation of two LTRs, all of the above. All right, 96% all of the above, that's the right answer. All of these are correct, including priming of minus strand by tRNA. That's why those tRNAs are sitting there 
remember the RNA is plus strand, so that's got to be a minus strand DNA. And there are two template exchanges. Let's, uh, let's take a look at the template briefly to show you these two template exchanges. First template exchange happens at the upper left when that short, that short piece of, of DNA runs out of template. So it crosses to the three prime end of the viral RNA. Uh, that is the first template exchange. And then the second template exchange occurs in the middle. When the second strand of DNA jumps, it, it runs out of template again and jumps to the first strand of DNA. Two template exchanges, that's what that means. So we end up with a double-stranded DNA flanked by LTRs. That's shown at the top here. So we've generated uh, LTRs at either N, and what happens next is that this integrates into the host DNA. So the second line in purple and orange, that's our host target. The retroviral DNA is going to integrate into it. And that gives us the integrated DNA, which is the proviral DNA. So that's the definition of a provirus. It's integrated into our host DNA. <clears throat> when uh, integration occurs by the manner we're going to talk about by integrase, the viral enzyme, it has two important characteristics which you need to remember. First is that you have a duplication of the target sequence on either side of the provirus. So that's illustrated very nicely here. You have an orange host target. That's where, that's where the proviral DNA, the retroviral DNA is going to integrate. And once it's integrated, it gets duplicated on either side. So you see two copies of this orange sequence. <coughs> All right, so that's the first thing that always happens. The second is that you have some loss of viral DNA at the ends, a couple of bases. So here, that's why we're showing four bases on either side of the LTR. AATG, once it's integrated, you've lost the two A's. So you lose a couple of bases at either end. You'll see why both of these things happen when we look at integration in a moment. So you can always, if you look at a sequence, if someone gives you a DNA sequence, and you see something in, the, in there that looks viral, and then there's what looks like LTRs, and then duplicated host sequence, that's a giveaway that that is and a retroviral integration. Right. Even if you don't know what virus it is, if you see uh, host sequence duplicated on either side of a viral insertion site, uh, you know that's retroviral. Now once this DNA is in the genome as a provirus, it's then transcribed by host DNA-dependent RNA polymerase to make the mRNA. It's not transcribed by the virus enzyme anymore. So the, there's a promoter uh, in the LTR which was built during reverse transcription. There's now a promoter in the left end that's recognized by host polymerase. You make a capped polyadenylated mRNA, and that encodes the viral proteins. It can be translated unspliced, or it can be spliced to give rise to the envelope mRNA. So again, you have transcription initiating at the left end. It happens within the LTR. It's not at the very end. That's why you lose sequences at the five prime end. And the, tr the transcription termination occurs short of the end, the right end of the LTR. So you lose sequences at both ends when you make mRNA from this viral genome. But that's how the viral genes are expressed from the provirus that's sitting in the genome. The host cell, the host cell looks at this and says, ah, this is a promoter and makes mRNAs, and it's making viruses that may end up killing the cell. Let's look at how integration occurs to explain why these two unusual things happen, the duplication of the sequences, of the host sequences, and the loss of the viral sequences. So integrase is a separate enzyme packaged in the virus particle. If you remember, reverse transcriptase, RNase H, R1 enzyme, integrase is a separate enzyme. And integrase binds to the retroviral double-stranded DNA as it's produced at the end of reverse transcription. It's then recognized by integrase. And the integrase chops off two bases at the ends, at the three prime ends of each strand. It needs to do that in order to do the next step, which is attack. So that explains why you lose two bases uh, at either end. The three prime end, which is produced by that cleavage, then attacks the target site on the target DNA. So the target DNA shown here in purple, it's laying across the integrase, which has an active site. The integrase then allows attack of the three prime hydroxyl ends, both three prime ends, to uh, the target site. And you see they're staggered sites. So now we move to the right. Uh, those, that attack uh, cleaves the host or target DNA. The integrase then ligates the viral RNA to the host DNA. 
sorry, the viral DNA to the host DNA at both sites. So now you have um, uh, the, the target is ligated to the viral DNA. Uh, it's then uh, filled in by integrase and made fully double-stranded. So now we have a duplication of the host DNA at either end by nature of the way this has happened because when you integrate in a staggered fashion that way and then you go copying each strand separately, you're gonna duplicate the sequence because you're making a copy of each single strand that you've generated by this process. That's why you end up with a duplication of the host which is shown here in orange. So you have a loss of two bases at the end and that, of course, the two bases are lost at this very final step because if you remember, we chew back two and then there's this five prime overhangs that don't match anything on the host anymore. So they get clipped off and filled in by the repair process. So that's what this is meaning here. We have two nucleotides being chewed off to make this a nice end that could then be filled in. So again, that blue, that light blue sequence and the, and the dark blue sequence are not hybridizing with the host. They're two uh, unbased paired viral bases so that they're chopped off and we fill it in. So that's why we have those two unique characteristics of integration because they're caused by the integrase enzyme. Now how does integrase get the viral DNA and bring it to the host? It's a pretty complicated process that we're just beginning to understand and it's diagrammed here in two parts. On the left we have the virus infecting a cell, reverse transcription occurs, we have this double-stranded DNA in a subviral particle sitting in the cytoplasm, then it goes into the nucleus. And we believe there are a variety of host proteins which bind uh, this viral DNA and allow it to interact with our genome at the points of nucleosomes. So our chromosomal DNA on the left is shown as a nucleosomed structure. And we believe that there are, that the integration occurs preferentially at sequences that are wrapped around a nucleosome. It doesn't preferentially go into these open areas that are not wrapped around a nucleosome, but rather uh, on the nucleosome sequences, probably because there are proteins, specific proteins are shown here as ledge F, uh, that interact with proteins bound to the retroviral DNA. And this is expanded on the right. Uh, here in purple we have the host DNA nucleosome, so it's round, wound around a histone which is shown in black in the middle. And we have this ledge F complex bound to the nucleosome, and that ledge F is binding cellular proteins that are bind to, in this case, a double-stranded DNA copy of the HIV-1 genome. So we think the protein-protein interactions target uh, the DNA to a nucleosome in this fashion, and that's why it targets the DNA wrapped around the nucleosome, because there are cell proteins that are bound there and not the uh, sections in between. And then the integrase comes in and makes the cuts and ligations and so forth and this gets integrated uh, into our genome, and it's there for good. So here, here's a summary of what we've just talked about. We have uh, two RNAs that come in with a particle. From that, we make one DNA copy. So we, so we lose a, a copy of the genome, if you will. Uh, we build a strong promoter at the left end in the LTR, and that strong promoter directs the synthesis uh, by the host transcriptional machinery to make a lot of viral mRNAs, which then give rise to proteins, and eventually the, some of those mRNAs are incorporated into new virus particles. So that's the genome being made in green, as well as the mRNA for uh, viral proteins. And one of my colleagues likes to say, for a retrovirus, there's no DNA replication and no RNA replication. When you think about it, all the viruses we've talked about so far their genomes replicate autonomously, either in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm. And that's not the case for retroviruses. They become part of our genome. They, they do replicate, of course, but along with us, and that's pretty unique. And they don't have a polymerase to replicate their RNA genome. They depend on the DNA-dependent RNA polymerase of the host cell. So in a way, it is true. They don't really replicate their genomes themselves. They don't repli uh, make mRNAs themselves. But of course, the host is doing it, and that's the beauty of this strategy. Someone emailed me this morning, uh, why do, you know, retroviruses have plus-stranded RNA genomes? Why do they have to make DNA? Why don't they just translate it? Well, by making a DNA and integrating it, now you're stuck in the host cell and you can be there forever. And as we will see, you know, every one of you has retroviral genomes integrated into you because your ancestors many, many years ago got infected. It went into your germline and you have like 8% retroviral DNA in you. What a great strategy. So that's why it's cool to make DNA. We're in seven, not we, retroviruses are in seven billion people. It's really remarkable. 
So here, here is a summary of that. The virus is coming in, and the RNA is made into DNA. The DNA goes into the nucleus and integrates. The mRNAs are made, which give rise to structural proteins and enzymes and glycoproteins. And some of these full-length mRNAs that are made get packaged into new virus particles. Now remember, the mRNAs are not the full copies of the provirus. So during reverse transcription, though, with all those cool template exchanges, you generate the provirus without a problem. Now, remember, the particles that are released from the infected cell contain RNA in them. And they also contain a reverse transcriptase. And eventually, when that infects a new cell, the reverse transcriptase within the cell copies the RNA into a DNA. So I'm making a point of that because for the hepatitis B viruses, it's going to be different. All right, integration of retroviral DNA has which of the following properties, catalyzed by a viral enzyme, occurs on all chromosomes, but preferentially at sites that are wrapped around a nucleosome, leads to the formation of a provirus, leads to production of viral mRNAs by host Paul II. All right, most of you got the right answer, which is all of the above. It is, so reverse integration is catalyzed by integrase, which is viral. It, I may not have told you that it occurs on all chromosomes, but it certainly occurs preferentially at sites that are wrapped around a nucleosome. It leads to the formation of a provirus, and it leads to production of viral mRNAs by Paul II. So they are all correct. Now this provirus, once it's there in your DNA, there's no way to get it out. And that's why when you get infected with HIV, you have a problem because you have proviruses and we're still figuring out how to get rid of them in long-lived immune cells. And we're gonna talk about that later. The only way for the virus to get out is by transcription by Paul II. As a consequence, when you get infected by a retrovirus in your germ cells, then you can pass them on to your offspring, and as a consequence, our genomes are full of old and new, what we call retro elements. These are retrovirus-like elements in our genome. Now, HIV, as far as we know, does not infect germ cells. So we do not pass HIV onto our kids. We have it in our immune cells, and we have it for our lifetimes, and that's it. It doesn't go any further as far as we know, because uh, germ cells don't have receptors for the virus. But many, in the history of humans, many other viruses have infected us, retroviruses, before HIV. And we have evidence of those infections in our germline. Those are called retro elements. A retro element is simply a sequence that moves around in a genome by virtue of reverse transcriptase. It's a DNA copy integrated in you when mRNA copy of that is made by host DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. That can then be copied into DNA by a reverse transcriptase, which may be encoded in that element itself, and then it can go somewhere else in the genome and insert. So you can see, starting from one provirus, you may have many more over time as these come out and insert in different parts of us. And when this happens in our germline, we call them endogenous retroviruses. So that's another very specific name. An endogenous retrovirus means the provirus is in your germline, and you pass it on to your offspring. And most of the ones we have, in fact, all of them, as far as I know, uh, of our retroviral, endogenous retroviruses are defective. They don't make infectious virus particles. But at some point, many years ago, when they infected us, and we're not just talking about homo sapiens, we're talking about our ancestors got infected. Uh, it may have killed lots of them, but at some point, they stopped where we were able to fight them off, they integrate it into the germline and they pass it on. And these viruses start to accumulate mutations over years. They're inactivated, uh, but they stay there. 42% of our genome is mobile genetic elements, and included in that are endogenous proviruses and other retro elements. They're not, they're not proviruses in the sense that they could make a virus particle if they were intact, but they're derived, many of them are derived from retroviruses and they can move around. So let's take a look at some of these. I find this really fascinating to look at this. So uh, on the left are the different kinds of retro elements that we have. And again, these are just elements that move around in the genome by virtue of reverse transcriptase. 
The mRNA is made, it's copied into DNA, and it integrates by a process very much like we've talked about. So on the top, we have endogenous retroviruses. Uh, in, our, in our genome, uh, these would be LTR-containing viruses here. So we have about 8% uh, of our genome is proviruses, essentially. They're inactive. They don't make infectious particles because they're full of mutations. But they went in many years ago, and the DNA is still there. You can, you can see when we sequence the human genome, you can sequence even the Neanderthal genome and see these things. You see LTRs. You see host duplicated sequences at either end, those arrows. That's what that means. You have gag, pull, and envelope genes. And these are all inactivated pretty much by mutation, but some of them have active RT. Yes? Are there fewer LCR-containing sequences in the Neanderthal genome than modern humans? <laughs> are there fewer in Neanderthals than humans? I don't know the answer. It's a good question. I can look it up. I'll let you know. Um, retro, then there's a class called uh, retrotransposons. And again, uh, these have LTRs. They have a gag and a pole gene, but there's no envelope, so they can't make particles and there's a duplicated host sequence at either end. We think these were actually in us before retroviruses. We think retroviruses actually evolved from these things by acquiring an envelope gene. Remember, the envelope allows you to make a membrane with a glycoprotein in it. So these, we think, are precursors of retroviruses, these retrotransposons. Um, they were there way, way back before there were any retroviruses. Then we have other kinds of elements called lines and signs. So lines are, again, retro elements that, that have integrated in an integrase-mediated fashion. Uh, they do contain a reverse transcriptase-like enzyme, uh, and they probably move around. There are many, many copies of lines you can see here. These are uh, non-LTR containing retro elements. You can see 16% of our genome comprises lines. That's a lot, 2 million copies. So they produce reverse transcriptase. Then we have what are called signs. These are, again, mobile elements, but they don't encode RT. They probably move around by the RT produced by these other elements. Uh, and you can see 10% of our genome as well. And then there are interesting things called processed pseudogenes. All these are are simply mRNAs. They're, they're made in the nucleus of regular genes, and they get reverse transcribed just accidentally into a DNA, and then it goes and inserts somewhere. And that's where it stays. You know, there's no, there's no promoter or anything. These get inserted in a non-integrase-mediated manner. So those are processed pseudogenes. We don't have a lot of them, but they're certainly in there. Did you have a question? Yeah, so if they move around, wouldn't that increase the risk for deletions? Yeah, in you, in the, in the human genome. Yes, so the question is, if these retro elements move around, isn't that bad? And the answer is yes. There are some human diseases that are known, that are linked to the movement of a retrotransposon. So we can see people that have uh, gene deletions, and you can see a retro element sticking right in there. So yes, it is, it is a problem. So, but there's not much we can do about it. We have so many of them, we can't get rid of them. All right, so these are, again, retro elements. They're in our genome. They're in our, our germline. We pass all of these on to our offspring. Now, uh, I said that most of the LTR retrotransposons, that is the retro elements, let me go back to this slide, the top one, endogenous retrovirus, that got there by infection many years ago. We were infected by a retrovirus that went into our germline, um, and, and you know, that's what comprises about 8% of our genome. All of the retrovirus, the endogenous retroviruses that we have at the moment, do not make infectious particle. They're mutated so that they don't work. Um, and one of them is interesting because it's been resuscitated in the lab, and some people call this the Phoenix retrovirus. It's called HERF-K, Human Endogenous Retrovirus. There are lots of them, and this one is called K. And we think K infected human ancestors uh, about a million years ago. So if you look at the radiation of hominids and pre-hominids here, here's today, where it's mostly, hom it's all homo sapiens, right? And uh, we have a number of ancestors going back two million years. So we think around a million years ago, uh, this infected our ancestor probably, you know, this one right here. And it stayed in the genome, and we have it today, HERF-K. And you can tell this by looking at the sequences and, and calculating back how long ago it went into the genome. A group down at um, Rockefeller, uh, headed by Paul B. Nash, took this DNA sequence, 
and made and fixed all the mutations. And you can put that proviral DNA into cells and culture. And he got back the virus, which is shown here, uh, budding from a host cell. So you can, you can resuscitate these ancient viruses, which presumably infected our ancestors so many years ago. I think this is really remarkable. Um, there's an interesting story going on in Australia and other parts of the world I want to tell you about. Koalas, you know, come from Australia, and then they ship them out to zoos all over the world. Well, it turns out in the past 150 years or so, these koalas have acquired a new retroviral infection. It's called koala retrovirus. They seem to have gotten it from rodents. And it's spreading throughout all the koalas, the wild koalas in Australia. And it makes them immunosuppressed. And they get leukemias and infections, and they're dying off. It's, it's thought that this may eventually eradicate koalas. And these uh, pie charts here show you the fraction of koalas in different parts of Australia uh, that are infected. So you can see these northern parts, the animals that were surveyed are all uh, infected. Uh, fewer and fewer towards the south, especially on some of these islands. But not only are koalas being infected in the wild, they groom each other, or they interact, and they spread the virus to each other. But it's apparently going in their germline. So the offspring have the infection as well. And they're making infectious particles, so the babies uh, get sick. And that's how they spread within colonies as older animals die. So we're watching endogenization in real time. This is very unusual. Endogenization meeting the entry of a retrovirus into the germline. We've never seen this happen. You know, our endogenous retroviruses went in a million years ago or more. We've never seen it in real time. And we can actually watch it happen here. And because these are shipped to other countries uh, uh, with zoos, many of them happen to be retrovirus positive. So many of the zoos around the world also have uh, retrovirus positive animals. All right, so that's one story I wanted to tell you. Two more, which are pretty cool with respect to retroviruses. So I'm telling you, we have all 8% of our genome is retroviral. But it turns out that some of it has actually been co-opted by us for good uses. And one of them is the envelope gene. Uh, the envelope gene, which is the glycoprotein in the retrovirus particle, it binds to a cell receptor during infection and allows fusion of the virus and the cell membrane. Well, guess what? At multiple times in evolution, different animals have taken this envelope gene and used it to make a placenta. Because you, you produce the envelope gene on the cell surface, it fuses with a receptor on a neighboring cell. Now you have a syncytium. And that's exactly what the outer layer of the placenta is. Here's the placenta diagram at the bottom. The syncytiotrophoblast, that red uh, line of cells. This is actually one big cell, all fused together. And the reason it's fused is because of a retroviral gene. Before this infection, these animals, I don't know, they laid eggs, whatever it was that you did to give birth. But then they acquired a placenta. You can see twice here in this phylogenetic tree. And all these animals here uh, have placentas as a consequence of this retroviral infection. So the protein is called syncytion, but it's clearly a retroviral envelope. So these animals were infected. And just randomly, one of them started to develop a placenta that was selected for in some way. And today, uh, that's why we give live birth. So if it weren't for viruses, we'd be laying eggs. That's what I like to tell people. All right, one more story. If you've ever seen a blue chicken egg, farmers breed their chickens to make blue eggs because they're pretty. All right, there's a blue egg on the left. Turns out when they breed them, they start with a chicken that's laying blue eggs, and they take the offspring, and they cross them to get blue eggs. They do genetics at a farm level. What they are doing is selecting for an endogenous retrovirus that's inserted next to the gene for the blue pigment. So that gene years ago went into a chicken because there are avian retroviruses. It inserted in the germline right next to the blue pigment gene. And then when you breed animals to make blue eggs, that's what you get. So I say for, if it weren't for retroviruses, um, we would be not only laying eggs, but they would be white and not blue. All right, last question. Which of the following statements about retro elements is not correct? There are many copies in eukaryotic genomes. They are currently entering the koala germline. Those in the human genome produce infectious viruses. They can be beneficial, none of the above. Right, C is wrong. Those in the human genome produce infectious viruses. Everything else is correct. We, we, at this moment, we do not produce infectious viruses. The example I showed you is where someone took that DNA and fixed it and put it in cell culture. 
Um, but if any of you were producing infectious viruses, we would know it. But that's not true. Okay, let us finish up with some other retroid viruses. They have reverse transcriptase as part of their reproductive cycles. Here's hepatitis B virus. This is the one with the weird genome, circular DNA, partly double-stranded with a protein stuck on it, a piece of RNA stuck on it. And these are envelope particles, as you can see in the electron micrograph. And they kind of are retroviral. They have an envelope with glycoproteins in it. And then inside that is a capsid that encodes this weird, partly double-stranded DNA genome. So that is the infectious virus particle. These other particles that you see on this slide are incomplete particles that uh, form when you just produce the viral glycoprotein. And actually, the hepatitis B vaccine com is comprised of just those proteins and no infectious genome. But this virus has reverse transcriptase in its life cycle. So let's see how that works. The virus infects a cell. The capsid is liberated into the cytoplasm by fusion of the membrane with that of the cell. Uh, the capsid docks onto the nuclear pore. The, the DNA gets in the nucleus. So again, this is a weird DNA that you can't do anything with until you fix it. Remember, to make mRNA, which has to be the first event in the, in the reproduction of this DNA virus, you have to fix, you have to repair the DNA. It gets repaired as a closed circular covalently linked DNA. And then it can be transcribed by host DNA dependent RNA polymerase. And you get viral mRNAs made. Those get shipped out into the cytoplasm, and from them you can make capsid proteins, uh, you can make the glycoproteins that will help form the envelope. Uh, but let's look at what happens to the genome. Uh, the longest of these mRNAs, the unspliced version, uh, gets exported here, uh, and it gets encapsidated. That's step number 10. So you, you see a partially synthesized capsid by the dotted lines, and in it is a plus-stranded mRNA, okay? Now also what goes into that capsid as it forms, you can see step nine, this thing called the P protein, and P is the reverse transcriptase, so that gets incorporated into the particle as well. Now what you see here, let's, let's follow the exit of this particle. Now, go step 11, you see now the RNA has suddenly been changed to DNA. And then the DNA becomes double-stranded, it gets enveloped, it acquires an enveloped uh, at the, Gol at the uh, Golgi and eventually is released from the cell. And the, the particle that is released already has a double-stranded DNA genome. So the way I look at this is it's like a retrovirus, except it could not wait to start reverse transcribing and it did it right in the cell. So as soon as the capsid was made and the RNA and the reverse transcriptase were together, boom, it starts copying it so that the particle has DNA genome before it even leaves the cell. And that's why hepatitis B virus, I think, has a DNA genome. Because unlike retroviruses, which package the RNA and the RT in the particle and it, they ship it out, and in the extracellular fluid, those particles have RNA in them, the reverse transcription of retroviruses doesn't happen until they infect a new cell. For whatever reason, the reverse transcription for these hepatitis B viruses start before they even leave the, cell, leave the cell here in step 11. Okay, so please pay attention to that. That's a really neat distinction I like to make between retroviruses and hepatitis B viruses. The other one is, notice there's no integration in the life cycle of this virus. These Closed circular DNAs are always separate from our chromosome. They're transcribed separately. So they do replicate on their own uh, and they're transcribed. So there's no integrase. We don't need it. There is a, an RNA-H activity, but there's no integrase because these uh, viruses don't need to integrate their genome. So let's see how the reverse transcription happens because I want to show you how you get to that final weird DNA configuration. And many of the steps are similar to retroviruses. You start with, it, with the mRNA packaged uh, in the virus particle. So here's the capped 5' end. And at, right, very near the 5' end, there's a hairpin structure which actually serves uh, to, to attract the polymerase. So the polymerase uh, is shown as TP here. And it's linked to a little piece of DNA, uh, which is the primer. And the primer actually hybridizes, even though the polymerase is captured by this stem loop near the 5' end, the primer hybridizes near the three prime end 
and, and the first strand of DNA is initiated in that way. You end up getting a single first strand of DNA. And then a little bit of the RNA is left. That was the initial cap there and at the bottom. And that acts as a primer for DNA synthesis in the other direction. And so we're here at the top left, we have that first strand of DNA. Uh, there is an RNA primer, which then, this actually jumps again to the other strand. A hairpin forms, as you can see on the right. It pops the primer off and the primer goes to the five prime end. You then start to make uh, DNA for the five prime end. There's a strand transfer and you start to get DNA synthesis uh, on the first strand down there at the right. So now you still have a little piece of RNA on there. You make a short, a short stretch of the blue DNA, the second strand, and, and that's where it stops. The whole thing stops there. I think in the particle, which is already formed in the cytoplasm, it runs out of triphosphates. A, there are a number of triphosphates, NTPs, uh, DNTPs packaged in the particle. And I think the enzyme just can't control itself. It starts copying right away as soon as it's packaged, but it can only go this far. And so that's what ends up being packaged. You have a partially double-stranded structure because it couldn't complete that second strand. You've got the RT, the reverse transcriptase, still stuck uh, on the five prime end, which is where it was at the top of this slide here. And you have the RNA primer left. So if you look at this DNA on the right, which you've seen now for a few weeks, all that makes sense. Partially double-stranded, couldn't finish the second strand. The RNA primer is left with the cap on it that started the whole thing. And the, the uh, reverse transcriptase is there as well. Now, it's really interesting because this RT has no subsequent role in the life cycle of this virus. Because when this DNA gets into cells, it's gonna be repaired by the host repair system to make it fully DNA, and then the DNA-dependent RNA polymerase will make mRNA from it. So this RT is finished. It couldn't quite finish its job. The host cell is gonna do that. But there's no role for that RT in the particle. Yes? Does it always stop at the same place? Uh, there's some flexibility. It's not exactly, yeah. It's sort of like when the triphosphates run out, which can vary a bit between particle to particle, yeah. So that's why the DNA looks like that. Yes? Um, why would the triphosphates run out in this case but not really any of the other Why would the triphosphates run out? So the other virus, the retroviruses, do not start reverse transcribing in the cell. They wait until they infect a new cell, and then the capsid is sufficiently degraded to allow triphosphates to get in. So that's on entry. But for hep B, you're synthesizing a particle, you're putting together a nice capsid, making it impermeable, so no more can get in when it's in the cell there. You only have the complement of DNTPs when that capsid is first assembled. So now here are all the retroid viruses that we look at. We've talked about retroviruses, and what's boxed is what's in the virus particle. So for retroviruses, the RNA is packaged, and when this virus infects the cell, the RNA is reverse transcribed into DNA. New mRNAs eventually are made, they're packaged, and they come out of the cell packaged as RNA. So the reverse transcription happens in the infected cell. And we saw the opposite for hepatitis B viruses, where the genome is this weird, partially double-stranded structure. When it gets into a cell, it's fully repaired. From that, you make RNA. The RNA is packaged in the virus particle, but then before the particle is released, the RNA is transcribed into almost full-length double-stranded DNA. So the hepatitis package essentially DNA, even though they started out with RNA in the particle. Now, there are plant viruses called cauliflower mosaic viruses that have reverse transcriptase in their reproductive cycle. What's packaged in the virus is a double-stranded DNA circle, which kind of looks like hep B. It's got, it's got a molecule of protein stuck on it. It's got a couple of gaps, one, two, three gaps, where there's some single strand. And you can see there's some RNA primers in green still left on them. And when this enters the cell, it's repaired to fully double-stranded DNA. mRNA is made from it. Uh, the RNA is packaged into a particle. And just like for the hepatitis B viruses, it's copied into DNA, but it, it doesn't finish the job. And finally, there's the last kind of retroid virus, the foamy retroviruses. These, are, these look very much like retroviruses. They have uh, the, the proviral DNA is flanked by LTRs. There is an integrase, RNA-SH, reverse transcriptase. Uh, but what's packaged here, again, are DNAs not RNA. So we think the RNA goes into the particle, but it's reverse transcribed. So it's very interesting that you have different ways to use reverse transcriptase. The retrovirus strategy 
is to employ it in the infecting cell, and these other viruses do their reverse transcriptase before the newly made particles leave the cell, and that makes that RT in the particle really not much use when it infects the new cell. So this is kind of the span. I think this represents in part the evolution of retroviruses, and these represent the different strategies that have evolved over the years.